Tennessee to be United States District Judge for the Eastern District of Tennessee. Madam President. Assistant Democratic Leader. Madam President, I'm sorry that the Senator from Iowa who spoke before me uh, left the floor before I could get his attention. Uh, Senator Grassley is my friend. We've served together for many years. We've worked on a lot of things together, and I'll bet we will in the future. Uh, I like working with him. He shoots from the hip, tells you exactly what he thinks. He's got, uh, I, I know this sounds a little vain, but a little Midwestern approach to him that I like a lot. And uh, he just gave us a little reminder here about the difficulties that faced some of the Trump nominees on the floor of the United States Senate. I remember that. There were some that uh, were delayed because of very basic things. Uh, they had not filed their financial disclosure forms and the ethics reports, which were expected of all cabinet nominees. Uh, I don't expect uh, President-elect Biden to cut any corners. I expect his nominees to follow uh, the rules and the law, and uh, I'm hoping that they will have bipartisan support when they come to the Senate. I want to give this president a chance to get off to a good, solid start, and he's going to need it. We are in the midst of this pandemic. The numbers that roll in every single day are frightening. Even in my home state of Illinois, where Governor Pritzker and Mayor Lightfoot and so many others have worked hard to establish uh, standards of conduct which will keep people safe, we know that the numbers are just unacceptable in terms of infections and hospitalizations and, sadly, deaths as well. Over 300,000 Americans have died. We want to make sure that President Biden, Vice President Harris, have the team and the wherewithal, the resources, to respond quickly when they take office on January 20th. I hope my Republican friends will join me in that effort. They have every right to expect these nominees to answer the very basic questions that are required, uh, but I hope that they'll also do their best to expedite that process so that those going into critical positions to keep our country safe from this pandemic are in place as well as those who uh, are going to serve our nation in critical capacities, whether it's Secretary of State or Attorney General or Department of Homeland Security. Um, but I look forward to working with my friend from Iowa, and I take uh, heed of his warning that uh, we will hold these nominees to the same standards as we held President Trump's nominees. Madam President, we are at the 11th and hour before a funding deadline where the budget of the United States is at stake. Tomorrow the continuing resolution expires and we are facing the prospect of another continuing resolution. I pray that we don't do that. This has been a very disappointing year for the appropriations process. Historically, the process begins with the President's budget and then comes a budget resolution passed by the House and the Senate for the spending priorities in the next fiscal year. We didn't do that. Then there's an allocation, usually, after the passage of a budget resolution of how much each subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee can work with, total amounts of dollars. We didn't do that. Then the subcommittees have hearings uh, in some of these subcommittees of appropriations, many hearings, to explore whether the dollar amounts that are allocated for a certain purpose really are well spent and serve their purpose. We didn't do that. Then the subcommittee is supposed to meet and vote out a, an appropriations bill uh, at the end of that process, reporting it to the full committee, and we didn't do that. And then the Appropriations Committee is supposed to take up the subcommittee's product, debate it, subject to amendment, and pass it out for consideration by the full body. We never did that as well. The matter is supposed to come to the floor of the Senate, be debated as well, perhaps amended, pass the Senate if it has the right necessary vote. We didn't do that. And then it's supposed to go to the House of Representatives and to see how it matches up with their similar work product. We didn't do that either. 
Ultimately, it may result in a conference report, according to the rules, between the House and the Senate, and that never happened. So the entire budget and appropriations process was completely avoided. And we find ourselves extending a continuing resolution for the spending of the United States government for weeks at a time until after the election. So now we face the prospect of the 11th hour, a decision to finish the work we were elected to do or to simply delay the situation again. Well, we need to do our job and we need to do it now. We need to pass our annual appropriations bills and to keep the government running. I cannot imagine the unforgivable and embarrassing tragedy it would be if the government is shut down for our failure to reach a decision. We need to pass a COVID relief bill. I was happy to join a group of 10 senators, five Democrats and five Republicans. Three weeks ago, we met for dinner one night, safe social distancing in one of the members' houses, and spent several hours talking about our frustration that we hadn't passed a COVID relief bill since March when we passed the CARES Act. And we know that things have gotten worse in this country, not only in the pandemic, but also in the state of the economy. For some reason, we just couldn't get, reach an agreement, the two parties. Well, this mixed group of senators, uh, both political parties, had a bold idea, let's try to do it ourselves. So we sat down, and in the course of three weeks, I cannot tell you how many hours we spent on the phone, Zoom calls, other conference calls, calls were even taking place on Thanksgiving Day, talking about what a COVID relief bill might look like. And some of the items we debated long and hard, most of them we agreed on. This last Tuesday, this week, we reported our bill to the United States Senate, to the floor of the Senate, and to the leaders. And we didn't just give them a memo with concepts, we gave them an actual bill that could be introduced today. The bill itself is significant in that it has $748 billion in spending. The areas of spending are fairly predictable. Extending unemployment insurance benefits with $300 a week federal supplement. $300 billion for business loans for those that are struggling to survive. An additional $13 billion for the food stamp program, now known as SNAP, so that people who are relying on that, perhaps in the midst of unemployment, will have enough to eat. $13 billion for our farmers, $25 billion for emergency rental assistance to avoid evictions, $34 billion to hospitals, clinics for help as well. A portion of that set aside for rural hospitals, $16 billion for testing and tracing, and the logistics of delivering the vaccine across America, $12 billion for a CDFI project for minority businesses, $5 billion for additional help with mental health counseling. And we know that this pandemic and the economy have taken their toll on the mental health of America. $82 billion for education, $20 billion of that for higher education. School districts and schools, universities too, have spent a lot of money because of COVID-19 and we want to help them get them back on their feet. $10 billion for child care, a critical element for many families. If they can't find child care, many people can't go back to work. We want to give them help. $10 billion for broadband. Expanding broadband became critically important when kids relied on it to continue their education and remote learning. $45 billion for transportation, everything from the airline industry to Amtrak to transit to buses, they've all been hit hard, and we need them to come back with our economy. $10 billion for our postal service, and boy, have they worked hard during this pandemic to keep up with the demands. And extensions of opportunities to use CARES money into the next fiscal year, next calendar year, I should say. And there were more. We reached agreement on all of these and came up with a bill that we presented to the leadership on both the House and the Senate, both parties. 
The good news is they didn't ignore it. They embraced it and started their own negotiations at the very highest levels of leadership in the Congress. Fingers crossed we may come up with a bill today, COVID relief bill. So from the time of our press conference on Tuesday to the delivery of a product as soon as today is an amazing accomplishment uh, when you consider all the time that we've spent waiting in hopes that we could find that solution. We have made significant progress. Funding the government is basic to our work in Congress, and this COVID relief bill is essential as well. Now, I'm disappointed in our work product as pride and disappointment. The disappointment is the fact that we didn't reach an agreement on state and local government assistance. I favor that strongly, and I hope we turn to that issue as soon as we return in January. Also, uh, there was a question of liability in lawsuits during the time of COVID-19. We offered several alternatives that Republicans countered with theirs. We never had a meeting of the mind on that issue. I hope that we do return to it at some point soon. We need to put government spending uh, on a course that makes sense for the next year that we're going to be tackling as soon as January. For the military and the FBI, public housing and transportation, medical research, cybersecurity, governing is the worst pot in any way that we approach it. Governing by CR is the worst possible way to do business. Continuing resolutions impede our government's ability to operate efficiently and frankly waste money. Taxpayers deserve better. A continuing resolution would leave us operating under funding levels which before we face this national emergency, which uh, is in every part of America today, it would restrict agencies from shifting dollars around to meet the challenges, and it would hurt help. It would hurt their ability to plan ahead, hire and train new employees, start new projects. Continu continuing resolutions cause delays in contracts and grants when we need them the most. There are many examples of these funding for national, medical research. I don't think there's an American alive today who doesn't value medical research more today than they did a year ago. Uh, the Warp Speed Project uh, appears to be a dramatic success, and I pray that it will be. Uh, although I've been a frequent critic of this administration, I want to give them credit for organizing this effectively and delivering a vaccine in a timely way, almost amazing timely way, uh, in, in this uh, pandemic that we face. I thank all who were involved in it, especially the scientists and researchers who didn't give up until they found these vaccines. We know that FEMA has been prohibited, would be prohibited from awarding Homeland Security grants to state and local governments unless we do our business of passing a budget. Safety and efficiency improvements in our transportation programs, such as bridge, bridge repairs, need to be timely and implemented. States and cities would not receive their community development block grants, which they desperately need. The list goes on and on. Our constituents elected us to do a job, and part of that job is to create a budget for this government. Months of bipartisan committee work and weeks of bipartisan negotiations should not be cast aside. I'm hope hopeful that we finalize a deal today and vote on it as early as today or tomorrow at the latest. We can't expect people to wait with any patience. We've waited too long ourselves. Let me close on a topic that is related to this, Madam President. The press reports of Russian hacking into the security systems of the United States are as troubling as can be. This is nothing short of a virtual invasion by the Russians into critical accounts of our federal government. It is possible that they have compromised some of the most important and sensitive information that this government owns, information that we rely on to keep America safe. Of course, Vladimir Putin denies it, but we know better. It's not the first time, but I hope it's one of the last times. We need to make it clear to Mr. Putin, to China, to Iran, to North Korea, and to any nation that would compromise and breach our security that there is a price to pay. No, I'm not calling for an invasion myself or all-out war. I don't want to see that happen. 
but it's no longer a buddy-buddy arrangement between the United States and Vladimir Putin. We have to take this man very seriously because he is a serious threat to the United States when he captures this kind of information which we use so that our troops are safe in the field, that we're safe in our homes. We thought we had a defense mechanism established. It turns out that it failed and compromised the integrity of our security in, cyber, in the cyber world. We need to do better through the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense, dedicate the resources, and say to Mr. Putin and others like him around the world, we're not going to stand by and let you take advantage of us. There will be a price to pay for this. And uh, frankly, if we do anything less than that, it is hard to imagine we're doing our best to protect this great nation. Uh, there'll be more. I'm sure there'll be secure briefings for members of Congress going into detail here. But the news that's coming out in the meeting, media is very troubling. We need to do all that we can to keep America safe. And when adversaries such as Russia uh, torment us, tempt us, breach the security of our nation, we need to respond in kind. Madam President, I yield the floor and suggest the absolute quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.